So first, a little bit of an introduction, why standardize and what are the challenges. But before I do that, I actually want to uh, mention a quick thing. I was expecting Roland actually to mention it, but he did not do it. It's a thing that, why are we in Glasgow? And the nice thing is, is Glasgow actually has a history with kites. Um, and one of them has uh, to do with the University of Glasgow in 1749. I know it's not the same university as this one, but this one did not exist yet at the time. I think it got uh, founded like 50 years later. But it started off with the, the first recorded weather experience. It's actually one of the first science experiments done with kites, uh, where they were trying to, well, they connected more to multiple box kites, and they were trying to uh, measure the temperature differences in the, in the atmosphere because they thought it was not the same as at the ground, but they didn't know, so they were uh, going to test that. So, uh, which is nice, therefore, to be here in Glasgow um, and talk about cats. So then, uh, to uh, move a bit forward to nowadays, uh, and because of my title, I focus on fixed wing kites. So, a small definition for if you didn't know, uh, fixed wing kites are kites that are designed more or less like aircraft, but we take into account this extremely high wing loadings that we can expect. But do note, we uh, changed the definition in the Glossary of Aerome in Europe to fixed wing kites and not rigid kites as we started off with because we're trying to minimize weight, we're trying to do structural uh, optimizations, and they might not be so rigid anymore and get actually flexible. So therefore, uh, please use fixed wing kites, not rigid kites. Um, so yeah, to uh, then go on to a little bit of the motivation behind my studies, um, uh, as I do the PhD at TU Delft uh, on Airborne Wind, um, but I try to go a little bit of a different way, I do a lot of structural analysis, but yeah, in order to do that, why are we actually doing structural analysis, it's just weight optimization, can we actually do something for the environment with it as well? And that comes from the fact that, well, it's don't settle too much on the on the numbers, but uh, from one of the studies, it turned out that like around of the, the large scale kites, megawatt size kites, uh, we expected 60% of the kites to be approximately due to uh, carbon fiber reinforced polymers. As some of you might know, carbon fiber is a synthetic fiber, it needs to be produced with a, a lot of energy uh, that you need to pump in. Um, and I thought, well, if we want to go away from carbon fiber, which is sort of much, uh, it's like very high performance, it's known in the aircraft industry. Um, if we want to move away from that, we need to come up with different solutions, but we more or less just, if we change the material, how do we study the viability of those materials? So how can we actually design it with other materials than these high performance uh, carbon fiber reinforced polymers or glass fiber polymers, something like that? So viability of these materials can only be done by studying the failure or as in, I guess, very preliminary early design phases and not going into high crack analysis or crack uh, uh, growth, but just some initial studies on failure of these materials, looking at stresses, uh, etc. And um, that comes to the point where I think we need uh, as we study this viability, we want some realistic cases, uh, like where do we put the kite, how do we orient the kite, um, in what condition is the tether at that time, and I think it would be worth it if we want to compare our values, uh, was also one of the initial reasons why we started off and create Megawis, uh, is we wanted the community to be able to compare, to be able to show that their models might be better, uh, or, or worse, but that's uh, not so good, of course. But to just be able to, to standardize something where we can say, okay, we have this kite, we have this kite, we analyzed it for these loads, and we can actually compare them because they were more or less studying the same conditions. And I think that's important. So, but in order to do that, I need to introduce a little bit our simulation environment. And one of the things that I um, probably won't change <laughs> um, is that I uh, work most of my framework in MATLAB. So I basically use MATLAB to, to initiate the code, generate, my geometry, mesh my geometry, and eventually run it in SimSim and Nostra. And I will, the code will eventually be, be made available, open source, which is parameterized geometry, uh, structural meshing. The only thing I could not make available is SimSim and Nostra, which is a code developed by uh, Siemens. Uh, but the reason I use this is it's, uh, uh, yeah, many optimizations of finite element modeling uh, and analysis, and I did not want to bother of the whole validity study or the whole um, validation of my software in that case uh, to prove that my structural analysis actually is, a, is, a, is, is correct. 
So therefore, we use a commercial software on that side. But it's basically just an exporting of the mesh to the software. So basically, you can use your own analysis software uh, by changing the export functions of mesh. So uh, I studied a few. Like, there's many failure modes. So there's many things you can do. I studied uh, a few of the things that I could do easily. Uh, I mainly look at uh, uh, linear static analysis or linear analysis because it's also easier to integrate materials in a linear way. Um, and also your elements, like the mesh, uh, like if you want to do nonlinear uh, solving, your mesh needs to be even more high quality, etc., etc. So I look mainly at uh, buckling. It's a nice solver. Um, uh, it does. It performs a linear eigenvalue analysis, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, I look at yield. So basically, export all my stresses from my structural analysis back into MATLAB, and I do some post-processing where I compare uh, if my composites fail, uh, but also if there might be some metals. Uh, Blade materials. I will also study that, and finally also Flutter, which can do, uh, which we can do in both ways. Uh, we have a Flutter analysis code in MATLAB, but we might decide uh, to switch this also to uh, Nostrum, as it also allows us to do like a non-constrained, um, yeah, the non-constrained analysis of Flutter. So you have like the rigid body uh, frequencies as well. Because there's one thing I need to do is if you don't want to do linear static analysis in uh, structure solver, you need to fix your structure in some way, which in our case is basically my tether attachment point. Then my ge geometry, I did a parameterize. So I basically have a, a, a buttload of parameters. You can reduce it. You can make uh, relations between some of them. But I basically parameterize my geometry, chord lengths, uh, wingspans, etc. I mesh it. Uh, run it, and then as I said, uh, the tether attachment point is constraints, so basically the single point constraints to yeah, keep my kite to the ground, because otherwise if you introduce a load, it will just infinitely move in space. So then, the standardization. So I make more or less now a comparison between conventional wings, so I'm talking like uh, Christian already mentioned, the IEC 61400-1, or uh, hyphen one, uh, standards where they show the design requirements and design load cases for wind turbine blades. And I kind of make a small comparison because I think we can use a lot of their knowledge of the wind uh, industry. And I also think we basically should because if we're trying to reinvent the wheel, it's going to take ages before we reach um, yeah, a viable state. So let's not try to do that. So I wanted to stress out a little bit what standardization in the wind industry, uh, how it started, or not per se how it started, but how it became so popular. It started with the, also with the reference turbines, so we have these benchmarks. Um, you have multiple benchmarks, I show in the citations, and basically just to stress out well, how popular those uh, reports and uh, publications were. It's been used uh, for quite a long time. I did my studies uh, for wind energy, at least at DTU, and I think I've done like a million analysis of the NRL 5 megawatt turbine uh, back then. Um, so basically also teach new students to use the turbines I think it shows some importance of using standard systems in this case. But then in terms of structural design, yeah, as I said, you have the IC standards. Uh, they were first published in 1994, <coughs> but please note, like, the first wind turbine built for electric, uh, electricity production was already in 1887. So basically it took more than 100 years from the first electrical turbine to be built to go to the first design standards and certification uh, procedures of at least of the design requirements of a, of a blade. Which, well, as you can imagine, that means, should we wait 100 years for the first to like, the system to produce? Sky cells would produce a full system, they would sell it, it would be flying, it would be operating, and then at some point we need to figure out, okay, let's make now some standards on how to do load analysis on a kite. I don't think that is a very smart idea, but that imposes quite some challenges for me, because I don't have a basis, I need to come up with them, but I also don't want to come up with something that no industry partner or no other researcher wants to use because that would make my PhD pretty worthless, which of course I don't want to do. So what I'm trying to figure out is does this actually apply, these design requirements? So does it apply to airborne wind? And I think it does. I modify some things, but I think it does. And uh, also there's this huge table, you can see the figure, uh, it comes from the IC document. Like a lot of load cases, a lot of design situations, and many things to consider. So I will focus on a very small part of that. So challenges that we encounter, as I said, there is no design load case for the design situation at this moment, at least standardized. So companies have been choosing their own ways to do structural analysis of their fixed link kites, but even soft kites, it doesn't really matter in that sense. Um, they choose their own uh, standards for that. So 
my other challenge is, does the index 3 actually agree with what I do? So as I said, I don't want my work to end up on a pile, nobody's using it. So I want the industry to more or less agree, uh, agree on my choices of load case. But that also means, means I need to keep it on a very high level, not be specific. You can use your own tools to figure them out or figure the loads out, but at least the orientation, for example, of the kite can be similar for whatever uh, kite you're designing. So I focus on mainly two areas, and one is actually very little, so I focus mainly on the power production phase. There's also startup and uh, et cetera, part positions and any of these other states. But I focus mainly on, mainly on the power production, and I will also discuss or propose one fault condition, which I think, well, that it doesn't exist in wind turbines, and I think for us that is uh, very important to do. So power production. Uh, when we look at a wind turbine, mainly what they say, the conditions you have to consider is that maximum mass, uh, rotor imbalance, but even yaw, misalignment, those are conditions they're specifying. They're not saying how to calculate, but they basically just say these are the things you need to consider. And then they say, okay, if you can come up with more specific stuff for your system, you also need to consider this. So what I'm trying to do is how do you translate this to the kite? And that comes to the identification of our design situations. So basically, are we putting our kite in full crosswind, meaning that when you put the kite on the side, for example, basically that the gravity aligns with the wing instead of pointing uh, perfectly out of the aircraft or downwards? Um, and are we putting it under the, the specified elevation angles? Um, or do you have to always run this analysis, run design uh, or dynamic simulations and figure out which positions around your flight path causes the, the biggest problem? You might can you can come up with some of these ideas, but what I'm trying to do is I want to run as much dynamic simulation as I can with the MegaVest framework, but a much more improved version. As we see, many people are actually working with the MegaVest framework, so I'm also trying to include all of these uh, impressive uh, improvements, uh, which I will discuss tomorrow in the MegaVest presentation. But basically, we'll talk about what other people do, not me, but they improve my work, which is very nice. So I'm trying to do that. Uh, I want to do some best uh, flight test data analysis. Um, I recently started a nice uh, collaboration with Kitecraft. It's a box wing, it's fixed wing, but it's a flight gen system. However, uh, accompanied with dynamic simulation, I would like to, to see if we can find along a flight path or along a circle or along a figure of eight, we can see the same critical conditions of, uh, of stresses and loadings uh, on the kite. And uh, one of the other things, theoretical extremes. As I said, we might want to do perfect crosswind as we imagined in the equations, the maximum power extraction point. We might think, okay, let's put it just, on, it's a theoretical thing because we cannot usually do that, or you need a very big tower that you suspend to be able to fly with a horizontal tether. Um, but in normal conditions, <laughs> the ground station is on the ground, flying in perfect crosswind means you're flying in the ground, uh, which we cannot do, but that might provide us with the safety factors we anyway, I think, in initial state would need uh, to be sure. So these are the things I want to consider, uh, as I have I've not run the, the simulations and found these critical conditions yet, but I'm planning on doing this. And then there's a few conditions that you need to consider in the power production phase. It's turbulence and main, mainly turbulence and dust. So first, turbulence is that uh, you can do quite a few different uh, turbulence models. You have to decide one of them. Uh, I think in wind industry it's mainly MAN and Kaimal that are recommended the IC standards. Um, but there has been some literature also using the Dryden one. It's very popular in aircraft industry. I mean, the end fixed wing kites are designed like aircraft, but we're flying at different altitudes. So this is still a thing I need to consider and see which one would be best um, for me to use and also in terms of simplicity, uh, etc. But how do we actually implement turbulence? Because I'm doing static analysis, right? The kite is in one point in time. It's there, it's on an orientation, but it's there. So how would I do that? So one of the ideas, and actually, it's not my idea, but it's, um, it's been implemented before, um, just not for airborne wind, is I think uh, what we can do is we take these wind speeds, the variation in wind speed, uh, and when you estimate your, more or less, your flight speed, you can see that if you take your, uh, your kite speed, or your, uh, together with the wind speed, you know basically what your current wind speed is, and you can calculate your angle of attack. What well, happens if this wind speed then changes, you can calculate the, very, the, the delta angle of attack or a, a, a variation of this angle of attack. And that uh, is what I would like to do. So basically, I uh, use this delta angle of attack, which comes from my turbulence analysis and, uh, and a delta side slip angle um, 
if it's possible, and uh, use those two as this in the static analysis of the structure. Um, if you want to do a full power cycle, uh, what would be smart is actually resolving it in time domain, because if you resolve it spatially, we keep flying the same pumping cycles, you need or a whole big grid, and you keep moving that through space, or you actually resolve the turbulence model fully in time, so you can keep going uh, in multiple pumping cycles, and you're not flying through the exact same turbulence, uh, yeah, turbulence field. Um, you can do a similar thing for gas. Uh, just gust would be considered more a, a sort of, a, in, in this case, a more of a 2D phenomenon in that sense, um, where you basically just consider uh, the delta area of attack. So you can do a similar thing. We, in this case, can use basically the symmetric Mexican head, uh, or the symmetric, yeah, the symmetric Mexican, uh, Mexican head gust, which is, well, you can see the figure, basically just uh, this amplitude, and you, we will discretize a few of these points, and then consider those uh, as the delta angles of attack and, and, and run the analysis of the structure and find out what the stresses are and if the structure failed. So it's uh, similar to turbulence, but then with different uh, amplitudes. Um, <coughs> then you have something in wind turbines which is extreme wind shear. And this is a tricky part because I don't think, or from what I've seen uh, from wind shear data, uh, or the data that we have at least, uh, it looks like this might not be so, at least not preliminary, an early design, so interesting for us to consider. Because what we're seeing is like basically uh, it happens that over a turbine from a hub uh, you would see a variation in wind speed due to the shear. Because the, the bottom part of the wind blade would be all the way close to the ground for example and the hub would be already higher and then you have other blades which also have this uh, difference in shear. But for an airborne wind energy system we fly already more usually higher than a wind turbine. Um, Okay, maybe if we design a wind turbine like 25 megawatts, you get close, but um, we fly higher, so we're already closer uh, with, like, let's say, less wind shear. Uh, and also, unless you fly perfect crosswind, you would, there, there is definitely some variations uh, along the wing uh, in, in speeds, but it might not, at this stage, it might be very, too much detail and not so interesting to consider. So I probably won't consider this. And then there is the fault control. So they, mention different fault methods for a wind turbine blades, which could be control system fails, uh, protection uh, system, or uh, an internal fault, like a generator shortfall, or anything like that. And I think for airborne wind energy systems, there might be many of them. There's also control system failure you could have, uh, as in for aircraft, you can do a similar analysis. But I think one of the things I should consider already is what we consider as a tether rupture. They might not be a tether rupture if you disconnect the tether before it ruptures, but there still is an effect on your structure. If the tether uh, ruptured, suddenly the kite will experience a loss of force. So this force that was there, and we're talking about incredible amounts of forces. If you have megawatts kites, you, let's say a three megawatt kite, if you reel out with like 10 meters per second, um, you basically <coughs> already have around 300,000 uh, newtons um, or 300 kilonewtons of force uh, that you lose on your system. If you have a, the megawatt kite, it was around the megawatt kite, it, is, uh, it was quite a heavy kite, but it, what, um, I think it was around 6 kilograms, uh, if I was correct. Um, but yeah, there is a large difference in magnitudes, and the force of, of lose, like losing the force of the tether is a big control issue, but if you look at structures, you will see that impact. And one of the things I can do in a static analysis is I can impose accelerations on my structure. As I say, way, as you do gravity, it's just an acceleration term. And I think what would be uh, a nice idea to see, as I've never not seen the results, maybe it, it doesn't make any sense, but I would like to see some simulation that actually impose or calculate this uh, loss of force causing an acceleration on the kite and use this acceleration to then do, see what that means for my stresses along the, along the wing. So I think that might be a, a good thing as well to do, and a very simple approach on an early stage as well. So coming then to the end of my presentation, uh, the conclusion um, is there basically are a lot of similarities with the IC standards that I think we can take as well, but you might modify it a little bit, or in terms of fault uh, DLCs, uh, you need to change it because we have different uh, systems that can fail than uh, a wind turbine does. So, 
many things, uh, criti uh, critical condition analysis is required, so basically I cannot move on with it without finding out what are the situations that I really want to consider. Um, so that is basically the first thing I, am, uh, I will be doing. Um, uh, then static structural analysis is what I'm performing. So as I said, the determinants and the gas can basically take this delta and little tech into account. It also delayed my research a little bit because I had to move from one aerodynamic model to the next. Because basically, if you fly as, a, as an wind energy kite during traction phase at high angles of attack, meaning a delta angle of attack in a positive direction, basically means you end up in somewhat close to stall. Or at least somewhere along the wing, you might encounter a phenomena close to stall. And our viscous panel method, the 3D panel method that Pani was using, well, will be far off, completely wrong. So we decided to uh, switch to the model that during his master thesis together with Mark Anna implemented um, and basically allows us to use the viscous polars um, to get our, well, let's say, a better estimate of what happens during this stall region. Um, so that's why I had to change models, it took a bit long, but I think with the delta angle of tech method that's basically uh, important, that once you fly at high angles of attack you also take this uh, viscous effects into account. And then the feather rupture modeling, as I said, I think like, uh, I want to do this with this sort of an added acceleration term, but if you come up with better ideas, please let me know. Uh, I'm happy to take this into account. So the future work is looking at these critical conditions. Uh, safety factors, I think, is a very important thing. Maybe, maybe your situation already takes a safety factor, as I said, with the crosswind condition, but you might also want to use others. The IC standards also has a very long, extensive explanation on safety factors and how to agree on them. But can we use the same? It's a bit tricky. Um, and then eventually design exploration, so running them for multiple different designs and uh, seeing if I can use these different materials which we initially wanted to do. So that's my idea. And uh, I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you I think we already have to bring the next speaker forward, Andre. Have you reached out to industry already or you need support on that? Because I think it's really be nice if you could start with that. Well, we, we tried that before, right? We sent out the email already, but there was, I think, no response because we didn't get any uh, info back from that. But of course, I was, when was that? Quite a while ago. Uh, quite a while ago, yeah. So, <laughs> Um, and of course I talked to yes, Kai Cross, but there might be any industry input, uh, input I can get and, and in, into the analysis uh, is more than welcome, because the more I can figure it out uh, what they see, the more we can make it useful, I think, to everyone. Sure. Yeah, sure. Thank you.